Hello my friends, it's the Game Boy Geek here, and today we find ourselves at the intersection of the most well-traveled trade routes in the old world, and which lies a city within rose-colored cliffs. A place where caravans five miles long enter the city through a narrow canyon called the Seek. Inside, traders from faraway lands find shelter and a place to trade their wares among the stunning buildings carved into towering red rocks. This is Petra, and never before or since has there been a city quite like it. Passing through Petra is for two to four players for ages 14 and up and takes about an hour to play. You'll be trying to spread your influence, the quickest among all of you, to become the most powerful leader in Petra. Today we'll be doing a rule school where I'll teach you how to set up and play the game so that you don't have to read the rule book yourself. Now I placed timestamps below me in the description of this video just in case you want to jump to a specific section of the rules. Without further ado, let's get started. Passing through Petra is a strategy game for two to four players where you're trying to be the first one to place all nine of your influence cubes. You'll be moving your merchant around the city grid in order to take different actions, which will allow you to take various traders from the different spots of the plaza and the seek. You'll be adding those trader tiles to your own market row and help your settlement columns get more powerful. And as the game goes on, you'll be building powerful settlement columns to multiply the amount of tiles here with the ones that they trade with. And that will allow you to move around the progress tracks, dropping off different influence cubes, and you're trying to get rid of nine to be the winner. And as you move around these different areas of the world, you'll be getting different bonuses that help you out throughout the game. You'll also be getting different villagers, which give you different abilities throughout the game, some right away, some on your terms, and some throughout the entire game. And you'll also be able to place influence by having similar influences in different parts of the world from influence cards. The first one to run out of their nine cubes wins the game. To set up the board, you'll lay it down in front of you facing this way so the word plaza here is facing you. I'm going to teach you how to set up the different parts of the board. Now what you're going to do is you're going to be placing canyon walls in these different sections A, B, C, D, and E. And you'll notice there's some holes that will be in the board that the canyon walls will fit in. Now I've turned the board sideways just so you can see how this fits in. Now you're going to grab one of the canyon walls. Now it doesn't matter which one you grab, they're all the same, but notice there's uh, two different sides. One of them is a flat edge, and this edge here is sort of a rounded edge. What you're going to want to do is you're going to place this in these holes here to ensure that the flat edge is facing the side that says plaza. It's going to be facing this area here. So now I have the board turned sort of upside down from where you are, just so you can see how it goes in. Now these have these little tabs here, and you're going to want to stick these in these holes and pull it this way so it sits flush right there. So it should slide in just like this, and you'll want to just slide it towards the board just like that. So this flat edge should go just up to the line that's on the board there. Now you'll do the same for the other four sections. So when you're done with this, again, notice that the flat edge is the one facing where these tiles are going to go in what's called the caravan here on both sides. The rounded edges are always on the outside of all of those. Now on the end of the board where the open plaza is, there's going to be decks of cards placed there, but you can put together this treasury card holder and you'll put it so that this beautiful picture of the buildings of Petra are showing as the tiles will be coming out into the plaza looking at it. Now behind that card holder, you're going to take the villager deck, which is the larger one, shuffle it up and place it here, and the influence deck is the smaller one, shuffle that up and place it like that. You're then going to take the top three cards of this villager deck and you'll place them in these three spots on the board, just like this. You'll also take the top three cards of this influence deck and you'll place them in these three greenish slots here, uh, and these will be used throughout the game as players will be able to gain influence by using these cards. Next, you're going to find these components and place them off to the side of the board as a supply. There's some gold traders. Uh, there are some permanent settlers, and these are going to be the five different types of settlers there. Now, don't confuse them with ones that look just like them, like this looks just like this. It's the same guy, except this has a silver border with a deeply, you know, sort of darkened background. So these ones are easy to find because they're the ones that have the silver borders, not the ones that like this that have the white border. So you'll place them like that. Uh, you also have buildings, camel tokens, and building extensions. Again, place these off to the side of the board as a supply. 
Next, you're gonna take all the other 84 trader tiles that look like this, and you're gonna put them in this bag and shuffle them all up. You're then going to randomly grab those tiles from the bag and place them in this caravan, starting at the plaza and working your way back all the way to the end. You're then gonna give each player a board randomly. They're gonna get all the pieces of the color that they've chosen to be. They'll put their nine influence cubes in the little spots in their board. They'll get five of these workers. There'll be five markers and a merchant pawn. Each player is gonna take their markers and they're gonna stack them on the X spot on all four progress tracks over here on the upper right hand side of the board. Everyone's marker is double sided. There's a white cube on the other and blank. You wanna make sure that the blank side is face up. All players will also take their merchant pawns and place them in the middle spot of this section here. And this is known as the city grid. Also at the bottom of the board, there's a green progress track. There's an X spot as well. And you'll place their last markers there as well. Each player will also be dealt one influence card face down. They can look at this secretly, but don't show it to other players. Then players are gonna receive camel tokens. Randomly assign a start player. That player will get one camel token. Then going clockwise, each player to the left of that player is gonna get one more. So the second player is gonna get two, third player will get three, and so on and so forth. Next, each player is gonna draw six trader tiles and put them in the bottom of their board. Now, you're gonna place them from right to left. And if you ever have more than three of any one type, like here we have four of these, you'll put that back in the bag and you'll randomly draw one until you don't have more than three of any type. This is known as a player's market row. Next, each player is gonna draw four trader tiles from the bag and place them in the corresponding colors settlement column. This is blue, so they go in the blue column. Each of the tiles also has an icon, and the icon to the left will match that for colorblind friendliness. Now, if you ever have more than two of the same, just like before, you'd put that back in the bag and draw a new one until you make sure you don't have more than two of the same in, to start with in your settlement column. Now, later in the game, you can have more than two, but not to start. The object of the game is to be the first to place out all nine of your influence cubes onto these different progress tracks. And these progress tracks represent different parts of the world, Egypt, Rome, China, and India. The game is played in clockwise fashion with each player moving their merchant pawn, taking an action, and then possibly completing some certain influence cards. So on your turn, the first thing you'll do is you'll take your merchant pawn and you'll move it in any one direction. In the direction that you move that pawn, you look to the end of there and that's the action you'll take. So because I moved this way, I will take the plaza action. Now that action allows you to take any two tiles from the plaza, which are the first six. You'll notice it says plaza here. As soon as this starts, this is no longer considered the plaza. This is known as the Seek, S-I-Q. Now here, you're gonna take any two of these and we're gonna add them to our personal market row. So let's say we decided to take these two. Again, you can take any two from the plaza. Then you're gonna place those two tiles in your market row and it doesn't matter which order you do these in. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna sort of slide this like this, this one's gonna come off, and because it is a blue one, it's going to go up to the top of your settlement column for that color. We're going to place this one in, and this one's gonna come off and it's gonna go into that settlement column. That is the plaza action. Now at this point, you could possibly complete some influence cards, but we're gonna go over that later. Uh, then you will refill to make sure that this is full. We took two tiles from there, so you'll randomly from the bag, draw on two tiles and place them at the end here, making sure that everything is sort of lined up and all the people are just like that. Now notice that I'm up to the edge of the plaza. I cannot take another plaza action because there's nowhere to go. And you can only move up, down, left, right, and you can't move past walls and you cannot move diagonal. However, let's say in this case, we went up so this we would take the seek action now that seek action allows you to take any one single tile from the seek which again is from here where the plaza ends all the way through to the end and let's say i want to take this one right here and add it to my market row so again we would just push these down just like that and the one that came off the end would get added to the settlement column of that color just like that now we'll talk about completing influence cards later but remember Anytime tiles are taken, they need to be refilled at the end of that player's turn. Now let's assume it's back to us again. The other players have taken some turns. And again, right now I can no longer take the seek action as the purple player because I can't move this way. And I can't take the plaza action because I can't move this way. Let's say I move this way. Even though I'm in a middle strip, the direction that you move in, you look at that spot and that's the action you take. So because we move this way, we will take the market action. 
So when you take that market action, you're gonna initiate a trade. You're gonna take one of your workers and you're gonna place it in one of these settlement columns that you're gonna initiate the trade with. And it has to be a column that doesn't already have one. For example, if this one already had one of my workers, I could not initiate a trade in this column again for right now. But let's say it's empty. We can place the worker here. Then what we look at is the number of tiles in this settlement multiplied by the number of tiles in our market row that match the type that this trades with. This is a red, also has an icon that is on the upper right of those reds. So these purples trade with these reds. So it's gonna be three times four, because there's four down here. So that is 12. I'll move up on the progress track and you'll move up on the progress track in the color of this settlement column. So purple in this case. So we're gonna go clockwise and we're gonna count 12. So we're gonna go one, two, three, four. Now, anytime you meet one of these triangles, you're going to flip this up. This is gonna help you remember that you have not yet placed an influence cube yet. You're also going to get a bonus. In this case, it is a gold trader. We'll talk about that in just a moment. So that's four, we're gonna go five, six. Now, as soon as you pass the first one on the left that has an open spot, and some of these are only good with a certain amount of players. This is for three or more. This is for four or more. Uh, so here we would now take one of our influence cubes and it doesn't matter which one you take. And remember the first one to get rid of all nine cubes is gonna be the winner. And so we'll place it in this far left spot. Now, if there was already a cube here, we would put it in this spot, assuming we're playing with three or more players. If there were two cubes here, we'd put it here, assuming we were playing with four or uh, four players. If not, you would just jump to the next spot over here. So we placed the cube. We've moved one, two, three, four, five, six. Now, because we placed the cube, we're going to flip this back over. This is just to remind you that when you get to one of these influence spots, the first one that's open, you place one. So we've moved one, two, three, four, five, six. We have six more to go. One, two, three, four, five, six. Now, anytime you land on or pass the triangle, this is just, again, gonna remind us the next time we come through here, we're gonna be dropping an influence cube at the first spot possible. Now, notice we passed this bonus spot twice in one turn. Now, you can only get one bonus per turn. So even though I passed this twice, we'd only get one gold trader. We're gonna talk about that in just a moment. Even if I passed more of this, I would have been able to put another cube. So if I if I'd had 13, I would have been able to go here, flip this over and place a, a cube there. So you can place more than one influence cube on a turn, but you can only get one bonus on a turn. So let's talk about these different bonuses. We just saw the gold trader. What you do is you immediately take a gold trader from the supply and put them in your market row. Of course, whichever trader tile comes off goes on your settlement column like this. This gold trader is wild. So anytime you're trading, this one can, can basically be anything. Also keep in mind, when this gold trader moves off and slides off your market row, it does not go up top, it goes back to the supply. But now, we've just showed you a bonus. Now, at the end of the turn that you've taken the market action, where you traded with, all of those in that settlement column will go back in the bag. Very important to remember to take those out and put them back in the bag after you trade with them. Now let's talk about the different bonuses. Over here in Egypt, you'll get a market extension. And this essentially allows you to add this market extension here. And what that allows you to do is when you take another tile, it doesn't slide down. It actually just sits just like this, which gives you more power in your trading. In the blue area, which is Rome, this bonus allows you to take a permanent settlement tile. Now, if you remember, those tiles were set aside at the beginning of the game. You'll pick any one and place it at the bottom of that column. Now, remember, they look the same, but they have that silver border and a little bit darkened background. These are always there. When we trade with this, again, those will go away, but you never get rid of this settlement, uh, permanent settlement tile. These essentially just act as one. They give you more power of trading with this specific column. And you can never have more than one of the same type in a column. Now, if you go over here to China and get the bonus, you'll get a building tile. So you'll take that building tile from the supply and you'll place it in any one of these spots that doesn't already have a building. Then, next time you actually place a uh, person from your market row onto that settlement, you'll gain a camel token. For example, let's say we got another tile. These push down. This would come up like this. And because we placed it here, we would get a camel token. Now, you can only get one camel token per round uh, like this. And it doesn't count if you get a permanent settlement tile. So if you put one here, that does not get you a camel token, only moving the normal uh, ones up here do. Now there's a local traders track. It's another progress track on the bottom of the board. And it's used when you're trading with the settlement column that's like this, this color here, green. It also has the icon on here. So when you move down that progress track, you're gonna move down like this. And on this one, you can get multiple bonuses. Let's say I got eight here. I go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I would get two camels 
and uh, one of these influence cards. Now I can take any one of these that are face up. And if you do take one of these, it immediately replaces uh, from the top of the draw deck, or you can take one from the top of the draw deck. Now we just talked about moving around here and getting camel tokens. What do those camel tokens do? Well, anytime you're moving along any progress track, you can spend as many camel tokens that you have to the supply and move one space per camel spent. So if you remember before, I had moved 12 and stopped right here. I could have spent one camel to move here, and because I'm placing one of my influence cubes, we then want to flip this over to show that we've spent that. So it's a way of trying to get uh, a little bit faster down some of these progress tracks. Also keep in mind, once all the spots are filled going around the progress track like this, they'll now be placed in this spot and it says infinity because there's any number of cubes can actually go there. Now the last action you can take is the village action. Again, moving towards the village. Now when you do that, you're going to take all of the workers that are there and take them off, allowing you to now do a uh, market with that specific settlement column. Now, you're going to remember how many of these you took off, and you can only take this action if you can take off at least one worker. Then you're going to take a villager card up at the top of the board. I've sort of spun it around so we can read the cards better. You can take this one if you took one or more worker off. Two or more workers, or three or more workers. So the longer you wait, uh, to take those workers off and go to the village, the more options you'll have as to which villager card you take. In this case, I have to take this one. Now, some of them with stars are immediate use. I would take this and I would take two trader tiles from the seek, then refill it, and this would get discarded. Uh, when a card gets used, all the rest of the cards slide down to the left, and the next one off the top will fill the spot just like that. Now these village cards are self-explanatory, but keep in mind if it has a symbol like this with the arrows, it's a permanent ability that's for the rest of the game, and this is a one-time use. You decide when to use it, and then you discard the card. Now remember, what you're doing is moving your pawn, taking an action, and then possibly completing an influence card. Now these are typically hidden from other players, but I flipped them up so that you can see them. They do different things, like this one says, if you have an equal amount of influence cubes on this blue area as you do the red area, you can place one of your influence cubes right on this, and you can complete as many of these as you want on your turn. So because in those two areas I have an equal amount of influence cubes, regardless of how many, as long as they're equal, I could place the cube on that influence card. Some of them are multiple areas, like this one says, between purple and orange, you add those together, and it has to equal how many you have on red uh, and blue. Of course, you have, it, have to have at least one uh, between both sides there. Now, they are quite self-explanatory, but on page 14, there's a reference for each of the cards. So play continues in clockwise order until any one player places their last influence cube. The game stops, and that player wins immediately. Well, I hope this helped you dive right into passing through Petra and get to the fun quicker than you normally would if you had to read the rulebook yourself. Now, I've placed a link below me in the description of this video, and if you have further questions, that's the best place to ask them, because not only will I be notified, but so will Renegade Game Studios.